small, but expands to be one of the greater territorial kingdoms in this particular region over time. So let's start with the earliest ones and move forward. If you want to take a few notes on, on your chapter study guide, you can. So Kush is going to be one of the earliest groups that's established. Again, roughly in that area on the Nile to the south and the eastern parts of the Nile River. Monroe being the capital later on, that's absorbed by the Egyptians as well. A lot of transportation on the Nile and the two branches of the Nile, the blue and the white Nile overall. And that transportation operates then largely the agricultural surpluses, but then also some of those uh, more highly demanded goods like we were chatting about earlier. So cotton is also grown in this region and traded, and some other objects as well. Now I think one of your groups in the trade simulation had like leopard skins, didn't they? Yeah. And you'll nice. just, I'm making note of that for the fact that over here in Nubia, this is a procession going to the king. You can see some of them are wearing animal and bringing animal type skins and other gifts in for the in for the king. So we do see those even in these early time frames. As you can see, they're around for roughly 600 years. They are absorbed later on. They are some of the earlier pyramid builders. Now these are smaller than the Egyptian pyramids, but again as we think about cultural diffusion and chat about those different pieces that are being shared in these geographic regions, obviously the construction methods are borrowed later on. Great sophistication in terms of that uh, process and labor, and again as you can see in the foreground here, extending back into very, very ancient times, and usually camels in these regions because they're able to negotiate that very difficult terrain with the sand and everything else. A few more views of the pyramids, believed to be, again, used largely as tombs, mostly for the royal family, it's believed. Most of these are cleaned out long before modern, modern archaeology has the opportunity to get there. So we have a few paintings from the inside, but everything else has been looted long, long ago. But as you can see from a distance then, they're, they're not tremendously huge, but you do have that sense of establishment of, of those groups and those clusters, I guess we would call them in the modern day. And these more well preserved, in, and if I'm not mistaken, probably restored as well. Much like parts of the Great Wall of China that have fallen into disrepair, China recognizes that tourist dollars continue to be generated by people coming. So they're actually restoring entire sections that have been in disrepair and decay and falling apart, where people even were taking during the great revolutions, the Chinese revolution, taking the bricks right out of the wall because it was being destroyed at the time. Now they're rebuilding with modern brick, as close to the old style as it, as it can be, but when you're there and you see it, you can tell the difference. Yep. Are they like a warring people? Or they no, fairly peaceful, actually. There's not a lot of competition there for any of the resources, and there's no other major groups trying to, to crowd in. Good question. Good question. So relatively peaceful. And just a few more you know, pictures of, again, as we're thinking about uh, symbols and ornamentation, hairstyles, uh, customs that are being passed down. You can see the hairstyles, the jewelry, collars, the use of the skins. And that would make you distinctively different in your manners of dress than some of the other tribes around you. Yep. Oh, about There it is. Yeah. Um, when they restored the ancient artifacts, still not make it less interesting to go look at the show if you want to look at the original thing? Yeah, whenever you can, you always do. Um, but people will still come, you know what I mean? If it's there, it's kind of like oh, if, you, if you build it, they will come kind of notion. So even here locally, if you can restore something that's been destroyed, people are still going to see it. Okay. That makes sense? Yeah. I, I guess we just have some of that nostalgia for the past, maybe. So. Yep. Yep. Will they specify the 
Yeah. Yeah, they'll let you know if you just versus Afghanistan. Yeah. And usually it'll be the mention will be Kushite for the Egyptian and African groups, and then the Hindu Kush to make reference to that group that's close to modern day India, Afghanistan. Yeah, good question. Yeah, some of those geography things do get tricky. Any other uh, questions there? All right, so next we want to move to Axum. Now you'll see two spellings for Axum. It could be the A-X, and sometimes it's the A-K-S-U-M, Axum. So again, phonetics and spelling and trying to get as close to the sound of the language that you're translating as possible. But they are the same, so it doesn't matter to me which way you are going to label it. But again, you'll see on the Red Sea, smaller area down to the south and east of the Nile here. Uh, fairly small capital city. The capital city's name is Axum, as is the empire's name. All right? So roughly 400 years, a later group, better known for their stella, or maybe we would call them like obelisks today. And again, we see some of those symbols repeating themselves when we come to modern day civilizations, trying to set up some of these monuments and, and pyramids or using those same kinds of symbols in the present day. Again, this one happens to be a royal tomb, roughly the 4th century, and just as a way for people to be able to see from a great distance where that tomb would be. Much easier to find it, right? Like Washington's Monument in Washington, D.C. The Christians. Now, this group today is even still um, an isolated pocket. They are the Coptic Christians in Ethiopia, the early missionaries coming down from Jerusalem happened to gain some converts in Ethiopia who then established this very, very stalwart congregation that expands and remains today inside of Ethiopia as well. Their famous, most famous church is this one that's dug down into the ground here. Here you see it from the top. In the next uh, slide, I'll show you from the bottom and the inside. It's roughly three stories tall. Now this allows for protection in terms of not only the environment, but as you think about if you're a group that's a minority group and there's potential attacks, this would be one more way to kind of keep you under the radar, so to speak, lower in terms of priority. So instead of building your mosque up to draw attention to yourself, dig down and try to protect it more um, inside of the hill. Yep. Okay. And the spelling on the map of local spelling is just wrong. Um, most of these will be the local spellings and what we're going to see on our maps for this time frame as well. Yep. A few variations, just like what we saw with Axon, but you'll see a few of those kinds of things. All right, so the church here, and then a close-up. As you can see, kind of geometric figures and shapes like the Islamic churches are using, the mosques of the time. You see some similarities there. Roughly three stories. And then, as we chatted about um, symbols of power, it's the same for religious leaders in many of these cultures and groups in, the, in that time frame, even moving forward. If you think about church ceremonies that you've seen, where they'll usually use um, hats or specific clothing or stoles, or they'll be carrying items that would mark them as the leaders of the group, whether it's a procession in the streets or inside the church itself, for the followers or believers, they would be able to pick out the leader fairly easily. And even you and I, as sociologists from the outside looking in, would be able to identify if this person was with a group of his followers, I think we'd be able to figure out pretty easily he's carrying <laughs> some things that make him distinct or different than the other people there. Yep. There's your reason why he's wearing some glasses that night. Um, you know, I've seen this picture a couple of times, and I don't know if it's just because we're in Africa and it's bright and sunny all the time outside, or if he's outside when the picture is taken, and maybe because he's standing in that archway there, a doorway, probably is sunny and he's on the outside of the church. No, uh-uh. There it is, yep. Future's so bright, I gotta wear shades, right? There you go. All right. Excellent <laughs> achievement set. So if you wanted to make a small list on that third question, you could add these four items. Axum controls that Northeast African trade. Again, as we pointed out with our trade uh, simulation here, those monopolies are tremendously advantageous for your economy. 
They develop a written language early on. Remember, the Egyptians later on have hieroglyphics. They're just building on the systems that are there ahead of them. The spread of Christianity in this region is because of Axum. So in North and Northeast Africa, and, and inside of even Egypt today, if there's a group of Christians being attacked in Egypt, they're probably the Coptic Christians who are related to this group from Axum. This one's interesting. I've been in like three countries where they all claim they're the ones to originate terrorist farming. The Incans in South America, the Chinese in China, and then the Koreans also claim they're the ones that developed it first. I mean, there's no way to really honestly say absolutely with certainty which group it's going to be. Because when you're building up your terrorist farming, you're using the rocks that are already there. And then obviously, given your oral history or the records that you might have, you might be able to trace it back a certain amount of time. But there's not any well-defined, we were first kind of notions. Because you're usually working with mountainsides and hillsides as your terrace farming, trying to make use of the maximum amount of fertile land that you've got. But Axum also claims, I guess we can throw them into the mix then, right, to be another group that... Um, advantageously uses terraced farming that. And then as we saw, those obelisks or stellas that they are using to uh, mark or designate their monuments to their kings. Makes them unique or different amongst the groups that are in the region. Anybody still need that slide? We're good? Okay. All right, a few more though. So Western. The dotted lines show you the Saharan trade routes. These would be caravans using camels and people on foot. It's not like highways that you and I can drive on because of the sands and the shifting sands. And they are probable because they're not exactly mapped out with great precision in this time frame like our roads and such are today. As you can see, the two big products are Exactly. And why is salt going to be so valuable? Preserves. Preservation of food. Now we have pre-refrigeration. We're trying to preserve our meats, our vegetables, everything else that we can. Not every region has salt, and so that's going to become a valuable commodity in your trade. There's actually more gold on the continent than there is salt. So it's kind of a reverse of what we might think today, because you could buy a pound of salt in those little Morton shakers for like a quarter, right? That would be relatively inexpensive in comparison to a gold piece of jewelry that you might be able to buy and wear. There's Carthage. We've already heard more about Carthage. And now, as you can see, we've got these other groups to the south. This is also earlier than the slave trade is getting established in the African continent. And most of the slave trade is going to come from POWs from the interior, tribes from the interior, and or you might sell some of your own prisoners and enemies to the coastline. The majority of those slaves are going to get shipped to which continent? Which one? North or South? North. Which? North America. No, you are South wrong. America. The majority Brazil, go England. to South America. Brazil, in fact, really? is the number one destination. Absolutely. When we, get, when we get to Latin America, we'll look at some of those stats for you. The majority of plantation slave owners in South America gobble up. Absolutely. Absolutely. So that's one of those things that because of your American history background, we want to fill you in a little bit more with those statistics when we get closer to that time. All right. Metallurgy. I think this shows us this shows us for Ghana the fine level of metallurgical work that's being done. Now, gold is a soft metal. It's fairly easy to scratch and break in comparison to some of the other metals. As you can see, it's being used as a uh, medium of exchange in Ghana in the shape of a, I always forget, crocodiles for them, alligators for us, right? Did I get it right? I think crocs and alligators are different species. I can't remember which one it is in Ghana. I'll have to look that up. Is it crocodiles? I think it is. <coughs> alligators for us. So 
As you can see, you've also got, it looks like a loop at the top, so you might be able to use it also as a charm or a piece of jewelry, perhaps, that you'd be able to carry around more easily, or display as your wealth, like we do. Yep. How big is that, Um, I think, I, oh, there it is, 17 oh. Oh. centimeters, yeah, so relatively tiny. Okay. Relatively 17 centimeters there. And just a little bit of damage. Again, a lot of this is going to get melt down, melted down by Europeans later as they come in, much like the Mesoamerican gold and artifacts that had been created by Incans, Mayans, and Aztecs gets melted down and destroyed. So that we have some of these artifacts is still pretty amazing. Gives us that opportunity to see, again, what might be valuable, artistically pleasing, and so forth. The salt in this time frame, as you can see, is going to be carried by a caravan and some ships. It's actually put into relatively large chunks to be able to transport. And because they're dry, they're relatively light. So it's not going to be heavy like, like rock salt. If you've ever had to lift up rock salt for your softener at home, or that, it's not going to be heavy like that. These, these bricks or bales are relatively light in comparison to what we have processed. So they're dried out, compacted, and then they're going to be used in those trade routes. The other advantage is I can break them into smaller chunks in terms of trade, much like I would do with gold and gold bars and gold bricks. All right, Mali, 13th to 15th century. Again, I want to point out,